First Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 13 is our text. We'll begin our reading back in chapter 16 at verse 29. Hear the word of God. First Kings 16, beginning at verse 29. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worshipped him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made the Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke, to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were, who were before him. In his days, Hiel the, Bethel, the Bethlehite built Jericho. He laid its foundations with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the set settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, Surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here, and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is before the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is before the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. And it happened uh, after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was, gather, was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that, that I may go in and prepare for me and for my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go. Do as you have said. But make me a little bread cake from it first, and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. The reading of God's holy word. Be seated, and let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we bless your name for the revelation that you have given of yourself throughout redemptive history that you have revealed yourself in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments and that you, O Lord, have been pleased to give us this word, preserve this word providentially so that we might consider. We pray uh, that we would, that you give us the, the Holy Spirit. We pray that the Spirit would come with power in preaching and that the Spirit would come in power in the hearing of your word. We believe the promises that you've given, uh, that your word 
uh, never returns to you void, but it always accomplishes that which you send, send it forth to do. We believe the promises that you've given us concerning the Spirit. We ask that you would be pleased to illumine our hearts and minds in this text of Holy Scripture. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The theme of 1 Kings chapter 17 is Jehovah's Word. I hope you saw that as we read uh, the first 13 verses of chapter 17. If we were to continue, we would find the very same thing uh, right to the end of the chapter, uh, the, la the very last verse of, of uh, chapter 17. Elijah points to this theme in verse 1 when, when he warns that neither dew nor rain uh, there will be no dew or rain these years except by my word, which is nothing less than Jehovah's word before whom Elijah stands, he says. Jehovah's word directs Elijah's itinerary, verses 2 through 4. Uh, Elijah obediently conforms to his word. Verse 5, Jehovah fulfills the promise of verse 4 to provide for Elijah by the brook Cherith in verse 6. and verse 7, Jehovah's word of neither dew nor rain is fulfilled. Verses 8 and 9 contain another word for Elijah to go to the widow in Zarephath uh, where uh, the Lord had ordained that he would provide for him there during the drought. And we see that Elijah heeds that word uh, as well. And then Je Jehovah's word, had we read, uh, continuing here in 17, uh, Jehovah's word to the widow is, uh, is confirmed, is fulfilled, according to Elijah's prediction. In chapter 17, is capped off by the widow's acknowledgement in verse 24 that Elijah is a man of God and that the word of the Lord in his mouth is true. Jehovah's word is the theme that pervades this chapter and binds it all together. And that gives rise to another prominent uh, pattern in chapter 17, namely the commands and promises of Jehovah's word and the response of obedient faith. The proper response to Jehovah's commands is obedience. The proper response to Jehovah's promises is faith. It's an obedient faith that is set before us in chapter 17. That's what Elijah did. He went and he did according to the word of, of Jehovah. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of, uh, of the Jordan or before the face of the Jordan. Elijah's obedience was an obedience of faith. He obeyed the Lord's command. He believed the Lord's promises. His faith and his obedience were vindicated when the Lord fulfilled the word of his promise. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. The rest of the land was in a drought. And God was, uh, there was a famine of bread. God was providing bread. There was no rain. God was providing water, sustenance, meat for his prophet. We also noted when we look together at verses 2 through 7, here in chapter 17, the surprising nature of Jehovah's provision. Uh, what's surprising about Jehovah's means of provision in that previous section, in, in verses 2 to 7, is that ravens were unclean birds. And yet, 
the Lord determines to use unceremonially clean, unclean ravens to provide for his chosen prophet. Not only did he use unceremonial, unceremonially unclean uh, animals to, to provide for Elijah, but we can only remember, assume that, that uh, the meat was unclean as well because uh, the ravens either picked it off dead animals or they picked it off live ones. And either way, uh, Exodus 22.31 forbids that any Israelite should eat of such unclean meat. Now, we see all these things in 2 through 7. And we see all of these things, Jehovah's word expressed in commands and promises, obedient faith with respect to his command and promise, and the surprising nature of his provision carrying over into the next section that we are considering tonight. In Jehovah's word to Elijah, uh, verses 8 through 13, we have this pattern of command, promise, and obedient faith. In Jehovah's command to the widow, in verses 14 to 16, we find the same pattern of command, promise, obedient faith. And the lesson that the Lord sets before us here is that the commands and promises of Jehovah's word call for obedient faith no matter how surprising or unlikely they may seem to us. Sometimes the promises, uh, when, we, when we look at the promises that God makes to us and we compare them with our circumstances, it seems highly unlikely to us that the Lord would keep that promise. But what uh, Elijah's experience, what the widow's experience is showing to us is that no matter how, how surprising uh, the, Lord, the Lord's ways are, no matter how he works, no, how, no matter how unlikely it seems to us, no matter how desperate it seems our situation, we're to obey his commands, we're to believe his promises. We are called to an obedient faith in our God. Now, we're, initially, I, I, had, I was planning to, to deal with uh, both the word of the Lord to Elijah in 8 to 13 and the word of the Lord to the widow, but I decided there was just too much material here. It's much too rich for me to to rush through. So we're going to deal tonight with God's word to Elijah, Jehovah's word to Elijah. And that means that the structure of the sermon tonight may, may seem a little bit uh, uneven. The first point is quite short. It was a sub point uh, originally. Uh, but nevertheless, we're, we're going to look at three things. Uh, in the first place, a surprising command. Secondly, the serious unlikelihood of the promise. And then Elijah's obedient faith. So in the first place then, a surprising command in verse 9. And that surprising command has to do with this, uh, this city of Zarephath. It was a rather unimportant city on the Mediterranean coast of Phoenicia, about eight miles south of Sidon and 13 miles. Um, miles north of Tyre. Both of those were major cities in Phoenicia. We don't know exactly how Elijah made his way there. We, we did, and, and the reason is that we don't know exactly where the brook Cherith was. It was before the face of the Jordan, before the Jordan. So it's either likely near the Jordan, east of, uh, uh, west of the Jordan, or it's near the Jordan, west of the Jordan. It's probably in the uh, uh, the area of Gilead, uh, uh, somewhere in that region. So we can speculate at least that Elijah would have had to travel about a hundred miles. That was a long way in ancient Israel. Uh, 
In normal circumstances, that, that would have been a, a long trek, but this was a time of drought, remember. And the scarcity of, the scarcity of food and, and water uh, would, have, would have made it very difficult for uh, Elijah indeed. But the, the surprise of the command comes from more than simply the length and the circumstances of the journey. Uh, Zarephath was not only outside the borders of Israel in the land of the Gentiles, but it was in the domain of Jezebel's father, Ethbaal, the king of Sidon. Elijah is headed for Baal's land in the land of the Gentiles. And that's why, in short, the command is so surprising. God takes Elijah all the way from the land of Gilead to Zarephath, to Baalsville. Baal worship central in the land of the Gentiles. And that brings us then secondly to the serious unlikelihood of the promise. The surprising command was coupled with a promise that is most unlikely. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. The promise is vividly presented for us. As Elijah heard the promise, he was expected to see what was promised. The Lord said, Behold, look, the God who commanded the ravens has commanded a widow in the land of Baal to provide for you. And as in the case of the ravens earlier, the Lord's command, unlike the word of the Lord that came to Elijah, wasn't a verbal communication that the widow was expected to understand and obey. As this account unfolds, we'll meet this widow, but she doesn't have any conscious knowledge that the Lord had commanded her. The living God orders the affairs of this world, even as he commanded uh, the ravens, who had no ability to hear a word from the Lord. So he commanded this widow from afar to provide for Elijah. Significantly, Jehovah didn't command someone of wealthy stature to receive and provide for his servant, Elijah. That's not his way. He chose a poor widow. The embodiment of weakness and vulnerability, someone who herself needed protection, support, and provision. A widow was a most improbable and unlikely source of provision for Jehovah's prophet. That's Jehovah's way. God has chosen the weak things of this world to shame those things which are strong. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. The improbability and of the unlikelihood of the promise was only amplified when Elijah came to the gate of the city of Zarephath, and we read, which we read about in verse 10. And what did he see? He saw a widow gathering sticks. And the fact that she had to gather sticks at the gate indicates the desperation of her situation. She had no one to do that for her. She had no one to help her. And the small detail that as Elijah comes into the city 
and sees this widow gathering sticks just adds to the pathos of uh, of the whole scene. Like Elijah, undoubtedly, we cannot help seeing this woman in the light of Jehovah's promise. Was this really? Was this really the one? Uh, There were lots of widows, undoubtedly, in Zarephath. Was this one, this destitute woman, the one whom the Lord had commanded, a less likely source of provision and sustenance for Elijah would be difficult for us to imagine, especially if we know anything about the plight of widows in the ancient world. So, a a surprising command, the serious unlikelihood of the promise, and then, uh, in verse 10, Elijah's obedient faith. Now, when he heard that command, he may have wondered whether he heard the command and the promise correctly. But he had heard it correctly. Go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow to provide for you. And as previously, the Lord commanded him to go to the brook Cherith, where he would provide for him by means of uh, the ravens, and that he would drink from the, the, the brook. Elijah proved to be unswervingly and exactly obedient to the word of the Lord. Arise, go to Zarephath. So he arose and went to Zarephath. The brevity of this command and and the response uh, teases us. What was the journey like? going there? Did he encounter difficulty along the way? How long did it take? Were the harsh conditions of the drought fell all the way to the city of Zarephath? We soon learned that they were. Verse 14 will tell us. But these things aren't the writer's concern. What matters is Elijah's obedience to Jehovah's word. Since the command and promise was one word Just as we noted uh, last time, Elijah's response was the obedience of faith. He believed the promise. He obeyed God's word. Elijah believed the promise, and he heard in that promise more than his eyes could see. We walk by faith. Not by sight, Paul writes, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So he called to the widow. And he said, get me a little water in a jar that, that I may drink. In Hebrew, Elijah's words are more gentle and polite to this widow. The King James captures it best. Fetch me, I pray thee little water in a vessel that I may drink. There's also an emphasis uh, uh, on the smallness of what he initially asks. A little water, he says. Same thing goes for Elijah's next request in verse 11. As she was going to get the water, he called to her and he said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. And as before, there was a, a gentleness to his words not quite captured in our uh, more modern English translations. And again, the Hebrew text emphasizes the humble nature of that request, which again is captured best in uh, the old King James. Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in your hand. My favorite commentators, uh, Old Testament commentators, I wrote this, 
To have a stranger ask for a little water is one thing. To hear him claim first crack at your last meal is quite another. So, hearing his request, she swears an oath to assure Elijah that she has no food, only a, the, the scant materials for baking her last meal. Her hopelessness could not be more dismal than what's described by the narrator in the text before us. As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. Behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and for my son that we may eat it and die. She's at the end of her resources. The drought has indeed reached the land of Phoenicia and the, the city of Zarephath. A handful of meal and a little oil and a, literally their last meal. Almost cruelly, Elijah intensifies her trouble, asking for the first helping of their last meal on earth. Verse 13, go and do as you said, but make me a little bread of cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterward, you may make one for yourself and for your son. The first words that we hear out of this widow's mouth echo the first words that we hear from Elijah. Here in chapter 17, Elijah said to, to King Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, and the widow now says to Elijah, as the Lord, your God, lives. And some have thought these words mean that uh, that the woman was already a worshiper of Jehovah. Others have taken the words, your God, to mean that she wasn't yet a worshiper of Jehovah. Now, I think the latter is true, that she wasn't yet a worshiper of uh, Jehovah. But perhaps that's beside the point. Which is that here in Baal land, someone acknowledged that the living God is Jehovah. The God of Elijah. The God of Israel. Jehovah is alive. Baal is not. Not only is Baal incapable of stopping the drought and bringing rain, which he should have been able to do had he really been a god because he was a fertility god after all, but Jehovah's provision also extends right into Baal's home territory, into his homeland his home turf, God has prepared a table for Elijah in the presence of his enemies. Now let's take a step back and, and survey the scene that we have before us so far in chapter 17. Elijah appears suddenly on the scene. We don't know anything about him. Never heard of him before, but here's uh, a prophet of Jehovah. And he arrives on the scene to announce to Ahab, uh, that there will be no rain in Israel. And then Jehovah commands his prophet uh, to go to the brook Cherith, to go away uh, from uh, the land of, of Israel, uh, and most importantly, away from Ahab, the king, the northern, king of, the, of the northern tribes of, of, of Israel. And so he's withholding rain, and he's withholding his word. There's a, there's a drought of bread in the land, and there's a famine of the word in the land. And this is a, a judgment on the northern kingdom of Israel. The word of Jehovah commands Elijah to go to the brook. He, he promises to provide for him in surprising ways, commanding unclean ravens to bring him bread and meat, 
which command uh, Elijah obeys and which God fulfills until the drought reaches the brook of Cherith, there most likely in the region of Gilead. Once the brook dries up, God's provision for Elijah gets far more dramatic. He's commanded to go to this little Phoenician town of Zarephath, which is in Baal territory. It's Jezebel's stomping grounds. And here God promises to use an unnamed, unclean Gentile woman whom he has commanded to provide for Elijah. He, he believes that, that a promise. He, he obeys that command. He goes to stay there and experiences God's power of grace there in the land of Zarephath. No, more about that in, uh, in uh, next week's sermon, Lord willing. What I want for you to see tonight is that each experience prepares Elijah for the next challenge. Each experience prepares Elijah for the next challenge he'll face as God's prophet. Yes, this was a prophet of Israel. Yes, he was a man of God. That's what they called him. But he's a man of flesh and blood like you and me. And he was called upon by Jehovah to put his faith in the promises and to obey his commands. And you see God working in the prophet Elijah in gradation preparing him by the brook Cherith for what's coming in Balesville, in Gentile land. We see this in other prominent biblical uh, characters. We see it in the life of David, who killed uh, a lion with his bare hands and then boldly faced Goliath and struck him down with a single stone. We also see it in the life of Jesus, the son of David and David's Lord, who endured the wilderness temptation and then faced the trial of the Garden of Gethsemane, where he wrestled with the cup that the Lord had given to him, the cup of the cross, and asked, Father, if you are willing, deliver me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. The wilderness temptation, the Garden of Gethsemane, prepared him for the ultimate challenge of the cross, the cup that he was to bear. Now that's true of Elijah, and it's true of the widow. Elijah tests her faith. He asks her to provide for him first and, and then for herself and, and her son. He assures her that, that there'll be enough for her and her son and that the flour and oil will last through uh, the drought. She trusts in his promise. She acts accordingly and God provides. That's what we'll deal with next Lord's Day, Lord willing. If you truly belong to Jesus Christ... This is borne out in your Christian experience. This is what God does for his people. He brings us through testing. He brings us through trials. He brings us through temptations. He prepares us for the next step. There are gradations in the Christian faith. We grow in our sanctification. And these trials, and these tests, and these temptations are used of Jehovah in our lives, to strengthen us for what's to come. My wife and I lived in poverty when we were in college. We were actually both in college at the same time, and then she had to stop because we could no longer afford to pay for tuition for us both. So she went to work, and she supported me. And during those years... We actually lived below 
the poverty line. Once I graduated from college, the next seven years were years of plenty. Had a good job. We had financial security. And then the Lord called me to seminary, where I spent four years doing a three-year degree. And we were again living below the poverty level. Now, mind you, we did not starve. And the Lord provided for us. But that first step was what the Lord used to prepare us for the next step. We were learning to trust in God's promises as Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And he did. Uh, We never starved. Our children never had to beg for bread. But we didn't have a whole lot of money. And there were a lot of times when we wondered where the next meal was coming from. And if you're a Christian, if you belong to the Lord, that's what he will do in your experience. Each trial, each test, each temptation is a step, another step toward the next challenge uh, in your faith. Each of you has a different story to tell, but it's similar in this way. That's what Jehovah Jireh does for his people. And that's what he's doing in the lives of all who belong to Jesus Christ. He he provides and he prepares us for obedient faith at the next level. You who are now and have been in the midst of trials and tests before the Lord, take encouragement in this wondrous truth. And as you come to that next step, Believe because the Lord has fulfilled his promises. Obey. Let your faith be an obedient faith in Jehovah Jireh, your provider. Let's pray. Lord, we so often come to these challenges in our faith and and we find it difficult still to believe because our faith is weak and we're so slow to obey your word. But we want to. We long, O Lord, to be those who are a people of obedient faith before you. And so we pray, as we so often do, that you would increase our faith, that we would believe, no matter how surprising or unlikely it seems, that you will fulfill your promises in our experience. Would you, O Lord, help us in our unbelief and strengthen our faith and cause us to obey your holy word. We bless your name for your promises. They are precious to us. We ask, Father, for grace to do as you have called us to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.